Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists to report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome Mary McCormick, president of the Fund for the City of New York. No, it doesn't solicit funds to refill the city's coffers. It's a dynamic organization created by the Ford Foundation in 1968 with a sweeping mandate to improve the lives of all New Yorkers. It honors the city's unsung heroes through its Sloan Foundation Awards. It provides funds to encourage studies in the sciences and mathematics, and provides bridge loans to nonprofit organizations that are waiting for their committed funds to arrive. And that's just for starters. Welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. You know, um, I bet a lot of people don't know exactly what it is that the Fund for the City of New York does. I rattle off some mm -hmm. of the things. But how did it come into being, and what was, it ma what was its mandate? You know, many things in New York City are partnerships. And this was created as a partnership between the Ford Foundation and the City of New York, Mayor Lindsay, when Ford built its handsome building on 42nd Street and didn't have to pay real estate taxes ah. as a profit. So it created really one of the first philanthropies in the city in which it was located in recognition of lieu of real estate taxes. And as you said, it was given this amazing mandate, improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers, uh, but particularly to do it through uh, improving the performance of government and nonprofit agencies. And that's really where we've been uh, since the beginning. Were there particular things that were going on in 1968 that made the foundation feel that such an organization was needed? Um, I, I wasn't here then, uh, but I do think that you had a charismatic mayor, John Lindsay, you had McGeorge Bundy, who was the head of the Ford Foundation. You had lots of issues that were churning about, and you had the pressure that remains to some extent today that foundations ought to be paying taxes. So this was an elegant way of addressing some, some acknowledging some responsibility to the city in which you were located. Uh, and it was set up initially uh, within the Bureau of the Budget. And it was to, um, you know, um, nurture innovation. But within a year, uh, people learned that this very small entity, source of money within Office of Management and Budget, really couldn't be effective. And so it migrated out within the first year. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the original kinds of, of projects that, some of the earlier projects that it took on? Um, that's a great question, and it's an interesting one because uh, even how many years later, uh, we still are um, acknowledging those early projects and the values that really um, determine them. One of the basic fundamentals of the fund from the very beginning and continues to today is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Now back then that was more radical than it is now, and one of the oldest programs of the fund was Sanitation Scorecard. And it was one of the first in the world of using tr uh, directly observed observers to look at and measure the cleanliness of the city streets. And that we, the fund maintained for nine years across administrations and across different commissioners. And it has for the last, say, 20 years resided within the um, Mayor's Office of Operations. But it is used, it is used for the allocation of resources, you know, and it is a standard. Um, we have continued along that line of work and other things that, that are um, to have a long legacy. Now, was this something where uh, regular citizens or was it community boards, local officials would sort of rate uh, the, the trash collection pickups, how well the city was doing? Is that how it worked? Uh, no, they were trained observers. Oh, okay. So the fund went and took thousands of pictures of litter on the street and then rated it. And then you trained people what this, this amount of litter mm -hmm. was a three, this amount was a four, so that you would get um, a consistent rating of right, it. Right, right. But that led to another very important and interesting body of work that we've done because in the 80s, when the city was not so clean, uh, the sanitation scorecard ratings were quite high. But if you were looking at New York, you'd say, well, New York is quite dirty. And so we went beyond that to say, 
how, how is it that, what do people look at, right, to assess the, the capability of government and how it works? And so we did a really very innovative work funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and our Center for Government Performance of doing um, a groundbreaking focus groups, really, uh, geared for this, of figuring out how people evaluate what's going on around them. And we didn't ask them any questions. We gave them, with professionals, 43 functions of government said what's important, what's not important. On the basis of that, we developed three programs, and one of them is called ComNet. And that's a handheld computer, time and date stamp, where we train um, citizens working through bids, community-based organizations or schools, to go and rate a neighborhood in a comprehensive way because it's the sanitation department, it's transportation, it's the post office. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't say, oh, that's the federal government's responsibility. You, you look at what's going on, and it's the graffiti. You know, it's the litter, it's the sidewalks. And that program... Do they do potholes? <laughs> or is that something, somebody else does that? Uh, if someone <laughs> else does that, but if I could answer that question about the potholes, because when we did these focus groups, uh, and we had 36 hours of tape. The one thing that was standard to the group from the Upper East Side or small businessmen or, you know, mothers in the Bronx was the smoothness of the city streets. It wasn't the potholes, it was the smoothness. And it was almost as if, you know, what can a government do if it can't keep the streets smooth? You know, I would never allow someone to repair anything of mine like that. And then you have the issue that everyone owns the streets. Right? You've got DOT, you've got Con Ed, you've got the cable companies. So we thought, oh, well, this will be easy. We will get some way to measure it. We'll hook it up with taxis and UPS trucks, and you'll get real-time analysis of the smoothness of streets. Turned out that no one had done that in the world. We could do it for highways, arterial highways, and for um, runways, and people didn't think it could be done uh, in urban areas. And under the leadership of my colleague, Barbara Cohn, who's the vice president of the fund, we spent three years, we didn't plan to spend three years, and really developed a laser, working with the private sector, a laser scanner that could go over the street, right, and measure the bumpiness mm -hmm. of the street. And then we took people from the focus groups back in that car to make sure we were right, uh, measuring the right thing. Having done that, it's now a work in, uh, private companies have taken it over. It's in other, um, used in other cities, but it's kind of we want measure it right for quality and then go from there. So if the streets aren't smooth, if they're bumpy, what happens then? Well, here, here's where we, uh, as you know, any innovation takes a fair amount of time if you go from the idea to a successful implementation. So we're still working on this. The idea, which has not yet been implemented in the city, would be that a community board would rent a vehicle that has a laser scanner, right? Someone's going to come and dig in your street. So you go out and you'd measure the smoothness as it exists. Because there's a law that says you have to repair back to standard. Okay. Right? But we don't know, without this kind of mechanism, you don't know what the standard is. But with it, you would. So that's what we're still working on. Okay. So now you grew up in a small town in Nevada. Yes, I did. And somehow wended your way east. And what brought you east and into a career in public service? Um, college brought me east. And I, I came east to college. And then um, when I was a senior at college, I read Death at an Early Age by Jonathan Kozol. And having read that book, and I majored in government in college, uh, and I'd worked in Washington uh, for a summer, but I wanted to be in the worst public school in New York City. And I, I'm rather determined. And so I found my way uh, to the school with the third lowest reading scores, which was PS 63 in East New York. Why did you want to be in the worst? Because I was young uh, and probably quite naive. Uh, and I thought I could make a difference, and I wanted to make a difference. And the city had a program, not unlike Teach for America back then, called the Intensive Teacher Training Program. And they were recruiting, bringing a lot of people to the city, giving us six weeks training, and saying, go for it. I would say practically 80% of what I 
the values I have and the, le and the uh, principles I apply, I learned in that job. Um, and so then that led to one thing after another after another that led me to the fund. There was a lot of idealism uh, in, the, in the 60s about uh, and feeling that we can change the world. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that same kind of idealism today? I do. And I see it uh, in such interesting ways. And um, one thing that's really not noted in the city is how many young people go from neighborhoods throughout the city and go to get very good educations. The ones we read about are the ones that go to Wall Street. But there are a huge number of talented, smart, committed young people who are going back to their communities with their great educations and saying, we want to make this community so everyone can live here. Mm -hmm. So it, but it's never reported. Where we see the other sides. Clearly, uh, Teach for America suggests there's a lot of that. I would say that our challenge is having enough opportunities for young people to find a way to both learn and make a difference, because I think the instinct is there at the same rate, if not more. Mm -hmm. So what kind of staff do you have at the fund, and how do you decide which kinds of projects to take on? Uh, we have a fabulous staff at the fund. They have uh, been in government or in nonprofit organizations, <clears throat> some in academia and the private sector. But they, to come to the fund, you really have to know something. Uh, it's not a good place. You have for, to have an expertise. You have to have an expertise. And then the projects are either existing and we want to take them to a new level or we want to build something. I mean, the one program I, I do want to talk about is the cash flow loan program. Uh, this is where the fund makes bridge loans to nonprofits against delayed government payments, against delayed foundation grants, against delayed box office, against delayed board pledges, whatever is out there. Last year we lent $60 million, which is a huge number, and by the end of December we will have lent a half a billion, $500 million, wow. in 10,000 loans. What's interesting about this, two things maybe three. One is these are high-risk loans that nobody else would be making. Uh, the second is we don't charge interest. We charge a service fee so we can pay for it. Uh, but in the world in which we work, we're, we're kind of not whatever the market can bear, which is often the way you price things. Ours is pricing according to what those we serve and work with uh, can handle. And uh, for a lot of these groups, they don't ask for delayed payments. And if they have to pay high interest, there's nobody, there's not a revenue stream right. coming in. Right. Uh, and then we do it very quickly because we value the time of people we work with in government and nonprofits. Time is money. And if you were to come to us, and we've got our broad guidelines, uh, you know, we could get the money out the door in two days. Wow. But well, you basically give them money to tide them over until they can get their committed Yes, funds. yes, okay. but it's a huge, it's a huge issue, and a lot of the groups no one will, um, no one will even look at. Mm -hmm. And so we, last year we doubled the amount of money. The year before it was thirty million. Last year it was sixty million. And we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with more with Mary McCormick, the president of the Fund for the City of New York, after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Mary McCormick, president of the Fund for the City of New York. Is the Ford Foundation still one of your major donors? Uh, the Ford Foundation uh, remains a donor. It is not a major donor. Um, but without the Ford Foundation, the Fund would not be where it is, and it would not have had the ability to be as innovative as it's been. Now you talk, we were talking. We've already talked about some of right. your your uh, projects: sanitation scorecard, cash flow loans. 
I gather one of your babies is computers, working with the internet mm -hmm. to um, give citizens and communities better access to right. services. Tell me about what you've been doing in that area. Well, uh, I'm quite proud to say um, that we created a center on internet innovation in 1994. And I would also say that if I had not already raised the money, I'm not sure my board would have approved because in 1994, uh, we were not as aware of the internet. But in our vision of it, it's a very powerful tool for the distribution of quality information uh, to people who need it. So our first projects were working with city government and one that we're uh, very proud of was one with um, court orders of protection and that you could put that together and make it available so that what would go to the court would be what the court officers want to see and you would have all the information. So you could put together the information you needed to file to get an order of protection. Right. The, questions, the questions that would be asked right. that would then put together the draft order, take the language from English back to legalese and do that. But then government moved in quite quickly uh, and certainly Mayor Bloomberg has been extraordinary in his use and, uh, of technology. So we started thinking, well, what about um, disenfranchised communities? And we had a project um, in Washington Heights in the South Bronx where we put computers in the homes of the families. We trained the mothers, they're probably better trained than you and I are in how to do this. We trained the young people so they could both sustain them and create on them. And we created content so that the vision there was to use the virtual community to strengthen the real community. And we worked with Alianza Dominicana and we worked with mothers where there were allegations or concern from the beginning of abuse and neglect of their children. We didn't know who those mothers were. And um, the whole thing about the internet is that you don't have to read. Most of us have just poured in text, but you don't have to have that. So on the milestones of child development, we did videos using young people to do the videos of the mothers in Washington Heights doing the milestones so that if someone said to you, Cheryl, uh, track with your child, which that's what it says. Well, I didn't know what tracking was. You don't mm -hmm. need to know that. But if you see a mother doing that or you see the Cheerio spill, then you understand what it means. And so we've done a number of quite innovative um, applications on breastfeeding, on nutrition, uh, that toggle English, Spanish, and that require a minimal amount of reading in order just to get better information mm -hmm. out there. And how many to how many households in Washington Heights did these go to? Uh, we start, <coughs> we did it in 100, which uh, is actually still a huge number because we did everything. Right. And the problem or the challenge that we have as a society right now is that we don't align the hardware right in the home with the ability of young people to sustain it and with the content. Right. So we'll put a thousand computers in a home, in homes, right? They're not hooked up to schools, they're not hooked up to the bodegas so that they sit there. And for us to really benefit from the full effect of this technology, we've got a ways to go uh, in doing that. And is that program still operating? Um, it's um, not as, a, it's not as, um, it's still there, the mothers are still using it. Uh, a lot of the materials available worldwide on the net and that's being used but we're we're not putting it in the homes we did the Washington Heights and then um, the South Bronx mm -hmm. and then uh, there's the in well we the economy hit right and so foundations have less money uh, we were very concerned and so we've kind of been stopped by that but we're not giving it up with government jobs being cut right and left right. Um, is that requiring some kind of response for you? I mean, are there areas where you could you can see trying to move in to fill in the gaps? Um, here's where my concern is, because they're being cut right and left, but in many of the areas in the city, particularly in the social service world, the system is government and nonprofits. And the nonprofits for the last 15 years have been asked to deliver the services. And so when government gets cut and the nonprofit gets cut, then we all need to be very concerned uh, about what happens to the services. And so we're, we all need to be concerned. We're concerned and we're looking at a variety of things that we can do and we've got some programs in place. Mm -hmm. 
of all the innovations that the fund has helped to develop um, to, to improve the quality of life in the city, um, what are your favorites? Do you have some, some pets, pet projects? I, <laughs> I always do. It probably depends on the day. Uh, but this morning, I would say my pet project is our, our partner program project. And we have created many things. And in the creation, you have to have the policy, the vision, and certain set of skills. And then life comes in with a whole bunch of legal administrative management HR issues. So we created a program, partner program, where we've got 45 or 50 par partners, projects in them now, where we take over the entire back office. There are employees, we take care of insurance, we take care of audit, we take care of COBRA, we take care of LMFA, we pay all the bills, we do all the budgeting. Mm -hmm. And it frees uh, these charismatic, talented, brilliant individuals to focus and their boards to focus on what they do best, which is program and fundraising. These are nonprofits we're talking about. These are non these are nonprofits. And I'll give you two examples. Susan Rodriguez, an HIV infected mother in East uh, Harlem, learned her husband was infected. She had a daughter. And in East Harlem at the time, while other people had access to drugs, they didn't. So she created this nonprofit actually to educate mothers, poor mothers, and to get help. She got an award from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the fall, one of the 10 outstanding um, health, community health people in the United States. Dana Buckman, a fashion designer, uh, started a project in the fall. And she uh, has a daughter who had a disability, and she realized how hard it was for her to get the help she needed. So she started Promise Project, which today they've been very successful. Uh, and Columbia University uh, Presbyterian is going to be testing some number of students who would, young people, kids, who wouldn't normally be tested so they can be put on the right path for education. Mm -hmm. The Center on Court Innovation won the Drucker Award for the Outstanding Nonprofit in the United States in the fall of 2009. It is uh, an amazing institution that is all about problem solving courts, and it's had an influence in the world as well as throughout the country. So, this is, these are amazing, and it's our privilege um, to work with these people. Tell me about the Sloan Awards. The Sloan Awards, I'd love to tell you about them. <coughs> the one thing that the city, most of us in New York, don't realize is how well served we are by people in government. And the Sloan Awards, um, which is the fund's oldest program, and we were joined, it's 38 years old, by Sloan, I think 26 years ago. We honor six unsung heroes of city government. And these are people at all levels. And what is extraordinary about them is their talent, their commitment, their intelligence, their innovation. Almost all of them are right side left side brain people. And every year when we present a group of people to a selection panel, we say, you know, we'll never be able to find as many good people next year. And we do. Such is the abundance. And these are people who uh, are committed. And to get that award, you have to have dedicated your life. And so it's not just being on call 24-7, day after day, year after year. It's really decade after decade and they come from all levels, and uh, they're a surprise. I mean, people think uh, that if you work for government, it's because you weren't smart enough to work in the private sector, and they think if you work in nonprofits, you weren't smart enough to work in the private sector or, non or, or government. But the truth is, in both government and in the nonprofit world, we as a city are so well served by extraordinary people of huge intelligence, creativity and, uh, and energy. We've got about a minute left. Um, what's on your wish list for the, for the fund? What's on my wish list? A short term on my wish list is I'd like to get more capital so we can make more loans because the demand is so great. Right. And the second is we're starting a center for civic apps. And we're looking to create apps that answer very particular issues for people that are very accessible. And so my wish list is, is that we do that. My wish is that we get that right and that it will um, turn out to embody our vision. Very interesting. I've learned a lot, and I hope that our viewers have learned a lot about this uh, organization that's doing a lot for the city but, you know, has been relatively unsung. We're out of time. I want to thank Mary McCormick, president of the Fund for the City of New York, for joining me today for the City University of New York and One to One I'm Cheryl McCarthy.